Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome our final speaker. Some of you might recognise him. His name is Jolyon Rubinstein. He is a writer, producer, director and was behind the BAFTA winning programme The Revolution Will Be Televised. We're really pleased he's made time to be with us today. He's rejigged a filming schedule to be with us today. He's been a huge supporter of the Junior Doctors and I'm absolutely thrilled that he's here with us today for Medics Under Fire. Good afternoon, Salam Alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply, deeply humbled and honoured to be speaking on a platform where so many have lost so much and where I'm literally standing in a spot where human beings have very recently in the last month been putting their bodies on the line and that is very literally what we're trying to protect. Those who give their life to protect the most vulnerable in a city destroyed and really decimated out of all recognition. I, um, I couldn't possibly add to the unbelievably profound statements that have been made already on this stage by people who know far more about that situation than I do. But I do have some thoughts about how we can move forward and also about just the nature of democracy in Great Britain and how we can do something about it. You know, this morning I woke up and I got a message from two of my best friends. They just had their, their baby, Freya. And, uh, and I thought how wonderful it was that they had received the attention and the care of junior doctors and pediatricians that serve in this country. And then I thought about President Assad, himself a physician, a doctor, who is quite literally killing those who trained him. Because he understands the value of the medical profession and understands that one doctor can treat 10,000 soldiers and that by making hospitals weapons of war, you do, in a very real sense, create the sense that absolutely nowhere is safe and nothing is sacred. I think that it's profoundly important we remember that we stand here today for the first time with a Muslim Mayor of London after what was a profoundly racist, uh, incredibly derogatory, constant uh, attack from the Conservative Party on that. But there is something else that, uh, that comes, yeah, I mean, it's kind of clap, Zach Goldsmith, Zach Goldsmith's, uh, Zach Goldsmith's unbelievable campaign, orchestrated by a man, Linton Crosby, an American strategist, who yesterday was knighted for his services to politics. I find it absolutely impossible to imagine that if white doctors in a country that was overwhelmingly white were being bombed, that there wouldn't be public outrage on a scale that is simply unprecedented. This is about race, this is about Islamophobia, and this is about a constant and unprecedented attack on the values, the religion, rather than the people who are suffering. I want to read you a couple of headlines that have appeared in the last couple of months. This is from the Daily Star. They've stolen all our jobs. These are front pages. This is from uh, the Daily Express. Uh, white men to face job ban because of Muslims. It would be laughable if these weren't actual front page newspaper headlines in this country. Why has there been no action in the last four years? It is because there has been a systemed campaign to disseminate the idea that you in Syria and I in Britain are different because I am white and you are Arabic and we have nothing in common. I'm here to say that I'm disgusted by that reality and so many people here today feel it, but they feel powerless to do anything about it. I've been quite involved with a charity called Help Refugees, who were quite involved in 
trying to make sure that 3,000 unaccompanied minors were given refuge in this country. And until earlier this week, 300 Tory MPs voted against allowing children to enter this country. But this country is the country that gave refuge to Jews through the kinder transports that allows me to stand in Trafalgar Square speaking my mind about the powers that be the rest and reside simply down that road and I am proud to use that democratic right to bring my voice to you and say it is not impossible to change people's minds it is not impossible to invoke the basic humanity that we all share and say underneath all of our skin we all bleed the same red blood and that red blood is being spilt all over Syria and enough is enough. I am I'm saddened and deeply ashamed to say that we are standing in a country that is doing very, very little to end this conflict. People talk now about possibly even allowing Assad to just simply remain in office, even though it's quite clear that that would be one of the worst hypocrisies the West has ever, ever take, take place. I want to read you a wonderful um, response to this horrific set of circumstances that was written in The Atlantic by um, Martha Glenhorn, who wrote, War happens to people one by one, which is true when you're in the midst of it, but when you're not, when the conflict is distant and abstract, war tends to happen one by the thousands. Reports of rising death tolls register but don't resonate. And then, every so often, one person's story transcends the numbering statistics. In this case, in Aleppo, they lost their final stolic defender of children, many no older than the Syrian civil war, whose lives are just at their beginning. When the last line of defense falls, what's left? When a doctor dies, how many other lives are destroyed or stunted as a result? This is just days after the UN announced that 400,000 people have died in the Syrian conflict. And Doctors Without Borders have well documented, as has been said, that you know over 50 staff and patients were killed when Dr. Moaz was so tragically bombed. Bombed. Bombing a hospital. The lowest and most cowardly of acts that possibly has ever transpired, but simply now is seen as a reality of non-linear war, which is a Russian idea, which has been promoted, which is that nothing is safe, nothing makes sense, and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Well, I stand here today to say that there is something that you can do about it, that your voice does matter, and that utilising our voice and the power that we have through social media and the internet transports our voice, because all these people who stand in Trafalgar Square are just that, people, no matter what race, creed or religious background they come from. And more and more, my generation and those much, much younger than me are seeing through the tawdry headlines of the right-wing press and recognise that we are all one human family. I know it seems very, very difficult, but like Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it is done. I'm honoured to be here with you today. Thank you for listening to me. God bless.